come to church, we think that what we say in church is sort of over here. Now, we hear truth. We put that truth sort of on hold. It's over here. Ladies and gentlemen, to hear truth, to know truth, to believe truth, to advocate for truth, without taking truth and letting the Holy Spirit of God put it in my life and in your life, we have wasted our time, we've wasted God's time. You got it? In other words, if I had time, I'd love to take every single person here and sit down with you and give you a little exam if you're married and say, how are you doing this husband thing? And ask some very personal questions, hoping you will answer me truthfully. Then I would go to a female and say, how are you doing this wife thing? And I hope you'd answer me openly and truthfully. Because what we're going to do and have been doing last week we talked about how to husband. Today, we're going to talk about how to wife. Now, understand something. Unless God's principles for marriage work, none of God's principles work. Did you get that? That's a staggering statement. None of the principles of God work unless the principles for marriage work. Whoa, here, I went through this. I, no, 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 no. God's principles for marriage work every single time they are applied and practiced in the life of the husband, in the life of the wife. Believe that. Absolutely applaud that. It is absolutely completely true. So somebody said, well, how do you husband? We dealt with that last time. And you'll remember, they went to that store in New York, and it was a husband's store, remember? And remember the rules for that store? Let me repeat. You go to the store only once, ladies, only once. It's six stories high. You can go up and up and up to the top story, but you can't go back down. You have to take the husband that's available on that story or take the exit. You got it? Very important you know the rules in the husband's store. So I took a young woman to the first floor of the husband's store and the husbands there all had a job. That's good. Then you remember she went to the second floor and the husbands there loved kids. That's good. Went to the third floor and all the husbands there had jobs, loved kids, and they were handsome. Women would say gorgeous. Then she went up to the fourth floor and she said, my goodness, all the men here have all these assets and plus, they love to do household chores. She said, it's magnificent. And then she went up to the fifth floor, and boy, all the husbands there had jobs. Oh, they, they loved kids. Oh, they were handsome. They enjoyed housework, and they were very romantic. She said, wow. And then remember, she went to the top floor, the sixth floor, and the sign said, welcome to the sixth floor. 1,223,563 women have come to the sixth floor, and there are no husbands on this floor. <laughs> Take the exit and go out. Thank you for shopping the husband's store. <laughs> Remember? What was the principle? 
Women are hard to please. I'm going to get to the husband in a minute. I'd say that amen if I were you. <laughs> Only kidding. And that is true. But what you didn't know, the owner of the husband's store was accused of bigotry, only selling husband, and he had to open a store in New York across the street that said the wife store. And so this guy goes in the wife store, and he goes on the first floor. Same rules apply. Remember, you can't you only go up. Uh, you can't go back down. You visit the store only once. So he goes in the wife store on the first floor, and there were wives who were passionate about all sports. He said, boy, this is great. <laughs> and so he goes up to the next floor, and there were wives who were passionate about all sports, and all of them were filthy rich. They had millions of dollars. He said, man, this is terrific. And then he went to the third floor, and it said all the wives here, they are passionate about sports. They're all multimillionaires, and they love sex. <laughs> now, nobody knows what's on the fourth and fifth and sixth <laughs> floor because no man has never gone higher than the third floor. There's a classic survey taken by Dr. Hurley, which shows the basic needs of a husband and the basic needs of a wife. I want you to look at them. This is in order of their importance. The basic needs of a wife, the basic needs of the husband. Well, there's supposed to be two different lists here. We'll do it different at a time. All right, there's the wife. There's the woman's basic needs. The husband's basic needs. Go back to it. You got it? Five basic needs, order of importance. Surveys, thousands of people. The basic needs, the other one. For the wife, right there. Now, you can debate with it, but all the polls are in, and these are the basic needs. And I'm going to tell you something that absolutely is staggering to me. I can show you biblically if a husband meets the basic standards of what a husband ought to meet biblically, every one of the needs of the wife listed here will be, will be satisfied. And if every wife will meet the basic formula of how to wife biblically, Every one of the, the husband's needs. In other words, these are just modern way of saying what God had already said in his book. Stunning truth. And we have talked about the husband. We talked about how to husband. Remember what we said, men. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 7. The rest of the formula for a man is found in Ephesians, other places too, but primarily the New Testament, is found in Ephesians chapter 5. And interesting, in 1 Peter, I don't know if this means anything, but I just bumped into it. Why did Peter give six verses to how to wife and one verse to how to husband? Huh. Why did Paul in Ephesians give 12 verses as to how to husband and a couple of verses as to how to wife? See the difference? I think that Peter, I know, was brought up, his home was in the home of his mother-in-law, Capernaum. I've been right there. Therefore, I think Peter knew a lot about women. He lived with women, his wife probably daughters and his mother-in-law. He knew about women. Therefore, when God instructed him and inspired him in the book of 1 Peter, he dealt with women with six verses, only one for the male.
husband. And then the other way around, you go to Paul. Paul was married evidently early in life. Maybe his wife died. People think that. But most all of his life, he was a single man. And therefore, he knew how a man should construct himself and didn't know much about women. Therefore, he had a couple of verses about how to wife and 12 verses just in that one chapter of how to be a husband. I don't know if that really... You see, God works right where we are. You follow me? He, he worked what Paul knew in his human life. He spoke divine truth, and Paul recorded it. God worked right where Peter was in his human life. He spoke truth, and Peter recorded it. Now, I need to stop and back up and ask the basic principle of how to husband. I talked about that last week. Hope you men are already put into practice. Remember what it was. You're to understand your wife. You are to be Phi Beta Kappa with your wife. If I could go around any men here, if you have done that this week, I could ask you, what's her favorite dessert? You'd know. Bang! Don't want to give a test, guys. You don't just go to church to, I went to church. A truth. Become a scholar on your husband. You want to become a scholar on American history? Guess what? Read a lot of American history. Men, you need to be out of sight. Know everything about your, your wife. Understand your wife. And then the second thing, remember, honor your wife. And I said it last Sunday, I'm going to say it again. All these little catty, catty, old-fashioned, bucolic, ignorant little jokes. Well, I married a woman. I did this. My wife, she did like her mother. Listen, guys. Your wife is sick and tired of that kind of humor. I can tell you that right now. Okay? Honor your wife. This is my wife. I'm proud of her. Say it publicly and privately. God's way to husband. You can take other way if you like to, guys, and just keep on the way you are. Or you say, Lord, I need to work on that. I need to work on that. And then finally, remember when I said, you are fellow heirs, guys, with your wife in all the blessings, God's grace in this life. You share that with her. Isn't it great you have a life partner to share it all with. Well, that, that's the thing of celebration. And then finally, the promise is, men, you'll be able to pray when you're right with your wife and clean and transparent with your wife. There's no secrets there. Guys, your prayers will take on wings. Just a little silence prayer or a bullet prayer. If you're not right with your wife, don't waste God's time because that sin is overwhelming. Don't say, Lord, help me or guide me until you've humbled yourself and gone and got right with your bride. Say, well, that's what the preacher thinks. No, that's what this book thinks and knows as we talk about the job description for the husband. Okay? Now, the job description of the wife. It's right here. Open your Bible, if you would, to 1 Peter. I taught you guys how to find it. Go to Revelation, turn left. It's right there. Wives. 1 Peter chapter 3. In the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Whoop! First operative word for wives is submission. Already half of you are angry. It's because you don't understand the word submit. Hupotasso. Submit means you position yourself under. You go to Ephesians chapter 5 before Paul begins to talk about the role of the wife, the role of the husband. He says, listen, position yourself under one another. Submit to one another. The husband submits to the wife. The wife submits to the husband. Very simple. Wives, you are to submit to the husband. What does that mean? You position yourself under them so you can give to them that which they do not have. Men, you position yourself 
unto your wife so she can give to you that which you do not have. Also, women get mad at the word helper. In Genesis, God created Eve out of Adam's rib. And then we see the Bible says Eve was created to be a helper. Oh, me, says the feminist. I'm to submit and I'm to be a helper? That's right. The word helper is used in the Bible as the Holy Spirit. God is called our helper in ages past. It is a high-ranking position. Submission in the Bible, you see it in Ephesians chapter 5. Listen carefully, please, and you'll understand submission, and you'll understand it is a tremendous word. Look at Ephesians chapter number 5. It tells us exactly. Submit to one another. Verse 21. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the Lord is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, listen, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands. Follow me carefully, ladies. The church is used here as a symbol of the wife, and Christ is used as a symbol of the husband. Christ did what for the church? Gave his life, was crucified, died for the church so that the church may be forever with God and be alive. That's the role of a husband. The wife then is submit to the church, which is the body of Christ, because the church cannot make it unless the wife is there in a submissive posture. You see how, how beautiful that is? The role of the wife, the role of the husband, both of them submit. As Christ himself submitted himself and died for the church, and now the church, in turn, is to live for Christ, this is the symbol that's used. Understand that, and you'll understand the fabulous word of submission. To position yourself under wives, husband, to position yourself under. Let me tell you something. Wives, you have a tremendous opportunity to do something with your husbands. What are you supposed to do with them? David was sculpted by Michelangelo. And when the sculpture was completed, by the way, it's in Florence. It's 17 feet high. That's a big David, isn't it? Made out of white marble. And when he finished it, doing most of the work in seclusion, he brought the statue out of David. And the Pope and all the artists said, it's the most beautiful work of art in all of history. Now, David was left out 300 years under the elements, this statue that Michelangelo did. In the meantime, somebody broke his toe off. Somebody crashed in one of his shoulders. Somebody bathed him in acid. And finally, he was struck by lightning. And then through those 300 years, there was pollution and dust on his body. And this beautiful statue of David was marred until recently. And they tried to find art restorers, people who major in restoring art. And they ran it by a lot of men and asked them if they would take the assignment of bringing the statue of David, the most beautiful work of art most people say in history. And all the men turned it down because they said the marble was of inferior quality. But a female art restorer in Italy took on the challenge and she is taking a brush and brushing this 17-foot high David so carefully, all the dust and them, and now the radiance is being restored. They even found a, a vein they hadn't seen in generations, and now David is coming back to life. Ladies, you have the assignment when you live like this with your husband to restore him to the statue that God intended him to have. You see the scripture? If your husband is not a Christian or sort of a nominal Christian or has all these questions, et cetera, et cetera, when that wife lives a biblical life, you are restoring your husband 
to the kind of man God intended him to be. My father was a nominal Christian. He would tell you not Christian, though we've been brought up in a little church in Cragford, Alabama. When he married my mother, my mother for 16 years loved him and prayed for him until finally he saw the light and walked down the aisle of our little church and that was the opposite thing my dad would ever, ever, ever do as he accepted Jesus Christ because my mother loved him without a lot of words. You have to speak words. Don't nag, nag, nag. I need to go to church. No, just live it. That's what Peter is telling us to do. Submit. As a church submits to Christ. You think the body of Christ, that's all of us who are We have a church up. When we submit to Christ, is that a demeaning thing? No, that's how we go. When, when we are helpers, is that a demeaning thing? I have three sons. Our family game was basketball when they were very little. I began to teach them how to dribble with their right hand, their left hand, how to fake, how to shoot, jump shots, defense. I worked with them. We had a great time playing basketball. I was their helper. I positioned myself under all three of my boys in basketball because I had superior knowledge. I knew what they didn't know. Many women have a spiritual sense of spirituality. They position themselves under their husband so they'll bring him out and shine him up and make him into the man God intended to be without a lot of nag, 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 nagging. They see it in their wife. Now, how did it work my boys? I'm not bragging, but one of them made the all-Southern team in basketball, scholarship, Florida State in basketball. Another one of my boys was nominated for McDonald's All-American in high school. All two of my sons made All-State in Texas, two of them here. The other one made All-Southern in South Carolina. You see, how did it happen? I became their helper. I positioned myself under them. Wives, that's what you do. Your husband do it a different way. And listen, if you wives will become full of the Holy Spirit. Well, that sounds too pious. It's very practical. When someone is in Christ, we accept Christ, what happens? We say, Christ come into my life, and the Holy Spirit, the very supernatural power of God, comes into a life. And therefore, the potential is there to have the fruit of the Spirit that people can enjoy flowing through life. What is the fruit of the Spirit? By the way, my wife, Lisa, has all of these in her life. Oh, yeah. It's potential. It can be true. Love. Anybody that doesn't want to have love in their life, would you live your hand? Love. Joy. What about joy? Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-report, discipline. Does anybody here say, boy, I don't want to have all that working in my life. Man, that's a, I'll, I'll leave out number three. No, that is the fruit of the Spirit that's in reach of every person here, especially, first of all, wives get there ahead of us, guys, and they position themselves under us with all the fruit so we can enjoy that fruit and maybe we can become the man that God designed us to become. That's not complicated, is it? Say, well, that's a long thing to have all of that. The Holy Spirit can do with that when we submit ourselves to our wise gentlemen and our wives submit our, themselves to us. And then what's the other characteristic there? Read it there in 1 Peter. I want to read it so you'll have it. Hope you have a Bible in your hand. Very, very clear. He says here in 1 Peter that wives also are to be pure. See it in verse, verse number 2. We'd have purity and reverence in your life. What is purity? Well, that's moral purity, of course, but it's more than that. Wives, you can't negotiate. Well, if you'll do this, I'll give you this. You can't be slick, manipulative. That's not purity. Wives, you're to be just plain, beautiful, outspoken. Purity. 
physical purity and then purity in conversation. So many females get to be so manipulative with their husbands. No, no, no. If you're going to witness to him and see his life come, that you have this joy that's unbelievable, you have to be straight. For this says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles or the wearing of gold jewelry or a fine clothes. It doesn't mean we don't look as good as we can look, ladies. I'm not against toes and fingers and hair and, and, and dress and neatness. No, that's a part of it. But don't go way over the side where you dress to be provocative. Provocative. You see, that doesn't honor your husband. It doesn't honor anybody else. So that's what he's saying. Wives, you are to be pure. You, you are to not dress overdo. Where I've, I've, I've seen women had so much gold and silver, and they were so dolled up, you couldn't even see their face, let alone their feet. <laughs> Paul is saying that's not the way you live. You live with purity. You live with simplicity. Doesn't mean you don't have jewelry. Doesn't mean don't dress. Doesn't mean don't do your hair. He's saying that's just merely the outside. What does Paul say? The important thing about beauty is inside. He said the unfailing inner spirit, beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. In other words, there is a gentle quiet. Doesn't mean you're an introvert necessarily. You may be very extroverted, lady, but doesn't mean it's a gentle way. It's a quiet way. It's not a confrontational way. And he says that's the way holy men of old, holy women of old live. He said they submitted themselves to their own husband like Sarah. Whoa, like Sarah. Who in the world is Sarah? In the Bible, it was Sarai. Abraham, Abram, and Sarai, you remember, left Ur of the Chaldees, a pagan land between the Tigris and Euphrates River. And God said, Abram, get up, take off, go to a new land, and I will make out of you a great people obedient unto me. And so Abram got up with his wife Sarai, and they headed off to the promised land so God could give them the land and bless them, and they would be a peculiar people who lived on the basis of God's principles. But in the process, my, what a long story. All of a sudden, Abram looked around and said, you know, God's not doing what he said he's going to do. We don't have a child. We don't have a boy. And then we won't go into all of Sodom and Gomorrah. We won't go all into Hagar and Ishmael. But finally, God said in the 17th chapter of Genesis, I believe, he told Abram, you are going to have a child by your wife Sarai, Sarai, and Abraham laughed. Look at it, laughed. <laughs> Listen, I'm 99 years old. My wife is 89 years old. We are going to have a child. <laughs> Abraham laughed at God's promise. God said, Abram, that was his name then, by the way. He said, Abram, is anything impossible with God? Anything? And Abram said, no, of course not. And then God said, I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham. And I'm going to change Sarai's name from Sarai to Sarah. What is the difference? It is a ha. Ah. In other words, God said, you're not going to be Abram. You're going to be Abram. Ha. Ah. It's breath. I'm going to put God in your name. You're Abram. Ha. Ah. God. Breath. And in Sarah, your wife, I'm going to put God in her name. It's going to be say, ha. Ah. All lives in the world, isn't it? And now you know in the next chapter, the angel appeared. He's talking to Abram. said, Abram. A year from now, you're going to have a boy. Sarah is going to have a child, and you, Abraham, are going to have a son. And Sarah, Sarah was listening, and she laughed. Abraham laughed the first time. Sarah laughed the second time. And the angel, the voice of God, said, Sarah, did you laugh? Read the Bible. She said, no, I didn't laugh. She lied to God. 
Don't be so pious. We've all done that, haven't we? Made promises again anyway. And then, sure enough, nine months from that time, Sarah and Abraham had a boy. And then read that in the 21st chapter. It says, Sarah said, everybody's laughing. <laughs> Here's a 90-year-old woman and a 100-year-old man. They have a brand-new baby. And now Abraham laughed, Sarah laughed, and now when the baby was born, they said, Sarah said, everybody's laughing. Guess what they named the baby? Laughter. <laughs> Isaac. Isn't that beautiful? You see, Sarah was not perfect, but she ended up in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the hall of fame of people who followed the Lord God Almighty. We're to be like, you're to be like, ladies, Sarah in your life. Believing God, living this kind of life before your husband, as husbands submit, as wives submit, husbands follow their Role their job described as a husband, as wife, follow their job described as a husband. That marriage can't miss. It is full of joy and meaning. Doesn't mean everything's perfect, doesn't mean we do everything right, but it means the big picture is one of constant celebration of marriage in every aspect. And when a husband follows the job description here, all the needs of your wife will be met. Check it out. And when a wife follows all the jobs here from there, all the needs of the husband will be met. Well, by the way, remember when you get married, you don't even own your body. You guys, you gave your body your wife. Wives, you gave your body your husband. Boy, that's a big thing. That's a biblical principle. So we see the job description of the husband, the job description of the wife. And so many times in so many stories where the male has been supreme, the true hero so many times has been the wife. Has been a, all you familiar with the Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. How many have seen It's a Wonderful Life? Remember Jimmy Stewart? Donna Reed? Oh, yeah. It's, it's a classic. I look back at that, and I picked up some things I'd forgotten. When they were dating, they went to a big old brick mansion, haunted house way out, and they were talking, and and, and Stewart, Jimmy Stewart picks up a rock and said, you know, it's a tradition. If you break a window, you'll get your wish. So he picked up a rock. He threw it this old dessert house. Crack. He said, oh, I have a wish. Oh, let me tell you what I wish for us. He talked about education. He talked about money. He talked about travel. He talked about extravagance. He said, that's what I'm wishing for you. It was Mary, Mary Bailey. He was George. Oh, Mary, that's what I want. He said, in fact, I wish anything you can have. He said, see that moon up there? He said, I can get a lasso and lasso that moon and bring it and give it to you. Boy, he was a dreamer. And he said, what do you wish? She said, I'm not going to tell you. He said, oh, you've got a wish? He gave all these extravagant wishes. She said, I'm not going to tell you. Remember the story? They got married. He was in that small town, a banker. And some problems got with money in the bank because of his uncle, and he got the blame for it. He became the goat of the town. They thought he'd swindle people, et cetera, et cetera. And he, he was just lost everything. He'd built his reputation on, thought about jumping over a bridge until finally he was affirmed, remember, around Christmas. They proved he was all that he claimed to be. And they go out and have a Christmas meal together. Of all places, in that old beat-up houses where they'd thrown rocks and broken those windows and made a wish. They were sitting there talking, and he said, you know, he said, you know, Mary, all these years I made all those big wishes about everything, and he said, you wouldn't tell me what you wished. Will you tell me now? This is a wife who stuck with that husband through tough, 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 tough time when the whole world had turned against him. And then he said, what did you wish? She said, my wish was, I could spend my life with you. Hmm. Wives, you have an assignment. Husbands, you have an assignment. 
just ask the Holy Spirit of God to help you and to help me to live out those assignments, and I can guarantee you one thing on the authority of God Almighty and that holy book over there, your marriage will sing. Our Heavenly Father, so much truth. We look at it, first of all, and we say, you know, that's sort of impossible. But, Lord, we know that nothing is impossible with you. Lord, we pray sincerely that some men who are here, some women who are here, may be married or unmarried, but those who are married will say, I want to be that kind of man. I want to be that kind of husband. I want to be that kind of female. I want to be that kind of wife. Lord, give power to these who are limping around in marriage so their marriage may truly sing and be freshly blessed by you. Some here, Lord, do not know Christ. They know about him, but they've never really invited to come in and run their life. Confess sin, turn away from garbage, and receive him and let his Holy Spirit Operate in their life. Lord, those who desire that, you're touching them. May they walk down these aisles in a moment and say, I want this family, this church to be my church family. Others here are Christians. They need to come in the life of the church so they can join hands of this body that belongs to Christ and make a difference to the world. Lord, speak to hearts, we pray in Jesus' name.